Hi everyone. Uh, today I would like to talk about Persian poetry and this is a little bit of the historical context of Persian poetry. So if you pick up um, like a, a translation of the Conference of the Birds or the Shahnameh, you could have a little bit of a context of why it's so powerful and absolutely amazing. And that's all. So this is kind of a little bit of like a starter pack for getting into Persian poetry. And the reason I call it Persian poetry as opposed to Farsi or perhaps one of the other uh, modern day names for it is because a lot of these texts were written during what you could call the medieval ages. So it's the 10 hundreds to maybe 12 hundreds um, roughly. And during that time Persia was a country and then you can get into the different empires that took over and then the Mongol invasion and a lot of the historical details um, but essentially at that time Persia was a unified identity and a lot of the modern countries like Tajikistan and a lot of these countries are relatively new and they're just new divisions because politics is always changing but, you know, it takes a lot longer for a heritage to change as opposed to politics, which is just politics are nasty bad. So that's why I'm calling it uh, Persian literature. And I think when you search Persian literature, you get a, a much wider culture. <laughs> and uh, Persia in modern day would be in the area of Iran, Afghanistan, and some parts of Pakistan. And again, that empire just changed a lot through history. When you start going through hundreds of years and even a couple thousand years, there's a lot of change that happened. So yes, so when you mention Persian poetry or Islamic literature or medieval um, Middle Eastern classics, there's usually three or four that come to mind immediately. When you say uh, works from the Middle East, usually one of the first ones that comes to mind is the English anglicized title of 1001 Nights, but it's actually called Arabian Nights is the original title translated into English. Um, but of course that's not poetry, but that's one of the most famous ones. And you have like um, Aladdin and you know, you get into these kind of like Disney, um, short stories that kind of takes out a lot of the original meaning. So for poetry we have the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam, I'm sorry. Uh, he lived in 1048 to 1131 and his poem, it was first translated into English in 1859 and I guess from there it, trans it was translated into a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, Russian, Polish, French, uh, I think Italian, a whole bunch of different languages. And then uh, we have Rumi. He wrote a lot. Uh, he came 100 years, 200 years later. Uh, he lived 1200 to 1273. He's also very well known. Uh, both of these writers, I read some of their works like way back when I was a teenager. I probably read them way too soon, but back then I wanted to read stuff that nobody else was reading. <laughs> so I probably didn't understand a lot of what they're reading. So when I read it way back then, I just thought there's a lot of talk about love and just the word love and I it went right over my head and I, I just kind of um, just sort of put them away and then I never went back to them again. Um, now as an adult, when I read the Conference of the Birds, I am just astounded at how much philosophy is in this. But I'm a lot older now, <laughs> so that's about maybe 20 years ago that I read these other other two. So I certainly want to read them again now that I know a little bit more about the context of Persian literature. And then Hafiz is, uh, he had a very recent translation of his work uh, completed by Dick Davies, who's a living translator for 
uh, Persian literature. He's just on a mission to translate as much as he can. And us English readers, we totally thank him for it. And yeah, so then the Conference of the Birds, it was published in 1177, and it was written originally by Farid Un Dinar, Di, so, I'm so sorry, Farid Udin Atar, and uh, yes. And then of course the Shahnameh May was written by Ferdowsi, very awesome book. Um, I'll talk, they will each get their own separate video, for sure, um, because there's so much to talk about with these two books. and. So those are just some common, like some well-known Persian literature. A little bit of the historical context is when these books were being created, if you think to Western culture that a lot of us are familiar with, the equivalent would be during the Greek times, um, in terms of like Plato and Aristotle and the philosophers around that time and the, the writers and the poets and the, the dramatists and I guess the artists, if there was art and music, it was a very rich time for Europe. And for this Persian medieval ages, this was an exceedingly rich time for culture and creativity and writing and philosophy and thought, even medical science was very advanced. And they, the House of Wisdom, the, these dates are really uh, very rough dates, but they're from the 18th to the 13th century. And the House of Wisdom, a huge purpose of it was actually translating text. And they were taking the ancient Greek texts and Persian was actually the first language that, that discovered these texts. So they were translating from Greek to Persian. And then when the Arabic uh, languages and the Arabic people, when they discovered these texts, they were translating them from Persian into Arabic. And then they eventually developed their own trade routes so that they can get the original Greek texts. And then they translated from Greek to Arabic um, directly and not using the Persian language as a go-between. And there's two thinkers that were um, developing more knowledge during this time that were part of the House of Wisdom. Um, the first one, his Arabic name, pronounced in English, is Ibn Sina. Um, his anglicized English word name would be Avicenna. And he lived during 980 to 1037. I absolutely want to read some of his works. He, I tried reading him last year. Um, he is very difficult to read. Um, he is the, just insanely intelligent. He what he what I was reading for he has a huge canon like um, I guess Thomas Aquinas could be an equivalent just just a huge canon of work and he um, he has some students that were that are a little bit more I don't they're not what more celebrated but they're um, I guess they're more read maybe they're easier to read than him because he's just so smart <laughs> he um, um, he take he took aristotle's ideas that he thought he was reading um a lot some of plato's ideas were actually considered aristotle's ideas and then they were they were fixed up later but um so anyways he, from his point of view he thought he was translating and writing commentary on only aristotle's ideas but some of them were plato's ideas and he added Islamic philosophy to these ancient Greek philosophers and he was writing the commentary on them. So you have to have a really strong understanding of the Greek ideas before you can even begin to understand how much further he's he's taking these ideas and he's adding new ideas to it. Um, so he's I guess he's basically merging the Greek original ideas with the Islam or um, Persian ideas and it's amazing <laughs> like four lines can just make your your mind just explode um, I'll put a picture of the book that I was reading it's just uh it was supposed to be an introductory book but it's it's way too difficult so I absolutely have to read Aristotle fresh and have him fresh in my mind before I even start with Ibn Sina 
The other thinker is Ibn Rushd. His English name is uh, Avaros. He sounds a little bit less medicinal um, and a little bit more literature, philosophical, maybe creative, I think. I'm, I haven't gotten into his works yet though, but I definitely want to. Uh, he lived during 1126 to 1198 and why, why would I read the um, Persian literature? Why do I find these books so amazing? Um, in, just to give you a really short snippet, this one, it's basically, it's an allegory of human beings, different types of human beings, um, given the, I guess, birds, they would be turned into birds and they would be on a quest to go and find something amazing. And in this case, of course, it's God. And it is, it's Islam, but it is without any of the modern day jargon and um, laws and legalese and all these kind of things. It's like a more pure form before all these modern changes happen to it. So it's, um, it's accessible to everybody. Um, and you can read it if you have like a Christian background or Islam background or the Eastern philosophy or um, the uh, Canadian background or just basically just any background. Um, Europeans could read it, just pretty much anybody can read it because it's written, I mean birds, everybody can relate to birds, right? So it just has that, that universal appeal to it, which I think is, is something that's really beautiful. Um, and I will definitely talk about this on its own because it needs a full video or even just a whole series because it's just, it's amazing. I like this one every bit as I like the Mahabharat because of how universal its themes are and how rich in philosophy it is. I'll just read you one line. I'll just randomly choose a page that I highlighted. Um, how about this, the prologue. This edition by Dick Davis, Davies? Davis is has the first prologue that's been translated into English I believe or the first complete one and there's a beautiful line let me find it okay here's here's a good one this is from the prologue the soul gave life to lifeless dust and he then gave reason so that we should see when reason saw he gave intelligence to bring us knowledge understanding sense when man was granted knowledge, he confessed to wonder, weakness as though dispossessed, and bowed before his throne as in the end, all bow there, be thy enemy or friend. Wisdom guides all, rules all, restrains all, and what's more wonderful is it sustains all. I mean, that's universal, that's in everything. Every faith and every country and every region and culture and heritage and language is just universal. Um, our soul and reason can't discern your presence and no one knows your attributes or essence, although you are the treasure that's inside each soul where soul and body are allied. Allied. <laughs> and then, so then the other one is the Shaname. This one is uh, very different. And the translation is written in prose. I would be so interested what this would be like in verse. I think he, he did a phenomenal job translating this um, because what he's trying to accomplish is a very difficult job. He's trying to translate another crazy long text and make it accessible for people who have little to no familiarity with Persian literature or literature from even the Middle East because it's relatively unexplored by English speakers um, and it's crazy because their literature is pretty amazing um, so he did make it into like a like a story style it's uh it's written in a prose instead of verse like poetry but I really think that the poetry version of this would be a million times better and there would be so much more philosophy woven in once you condense the words down into just a verse as opposed to um, like a, a novel, like a prose. So that's basically it. So this is just like a, a launching point to 
welcome you to getting into Persian literature because it's absolutely amazing. So if you want to read more specifically about the poetry, um, there's three videos that I could recommend. All three of them are amazing. The first one is called The Paradox That Is Persia. It's a, it's a TEDx talk, so it's only about 10 minutes long. He gives a really good overview of the history of the Persian region and its culture and literature. Uh, he also touches on some ways that Persian culture can affect Western literature. And this one is not in English. Um, and there's no subtitles, unless maybe you go to the original TEDx website. It's called The Beauty of Persian Poetry by Hamid Riza Mohammadi. And it's also a TEDx talk, about 10 minutes long, 14 minutes. And the last one is The Persian Language and What Makes It Fascinating. And this one's by the Lying Focus channel, where he talks about the, the details of the Persian language and different politics that came into it in modern day for the details of that stuff. So that's all. So thanks for listening. Bye everyone.